Welcome. The following is a Los Angeles and SIGGRAPH and Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAPH presentation, Lightfield Lab with John Carafin. Our speaker will present the latest developments in Lightfield Lab's solid light holographic display technology. I'm Joan Collins, chair of the Los Angeles ACM SIGGRAPH. We are jointly presenting um, tonight with Silicon Valley. We are the Los Angeles professional chapter of the Association for Computing Machinery's special interest group on computer graphics and interactive techniques. We um, are co-presenting with Silicon Valley and uh, we have our guest here tonight. Uh, Alesh, are you there? Uh, yes, I, oh, yes, I am here. Uh, uh, hello, Joan. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so Silicon Valley is uh, co-hosting this event. And I just want to say that Silicon Valley SIGGRAPH is the SIGGRAPH chapter, one of two SIGGRAPH chapters in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we focus on technology and typically hold a meeting in the Silicon Valley about once a month, although we have been online ever since COVID hit. And um, yeah, and so if you, if you want to find out more about us, please Google Silicon Valley to graph into Google and thank you. That's great. We'll put that in the chat as well all throughout the evening. So we are live from Los Angeles, Silicon Valley and San Jose, California. And our attendees are here from around the world. And we are also recording this panel to watch on our website. I'm sure that you'll all enjoy John Carafin, CEO and co-founder from Lightfield Labs. First, I'd like to thank our electronic services team for providing this webinar around the world. I'd also like to thank the Los Angeles chapter and Silicon Valley chapter of ACM SIGGRAPH and all of those from Lightfield Labs who have helped us put this together. For those of you on Zoom, please put your questions into the Q&A so that we can ask them of our panelists. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker from Lightfield Labs, to present the latest developments in Lightfield Labs solid light holographic display technology. He has an extensive background in light field and visual effects technology. While having previously held executive roles at Lytro, RealD, and Digital Domain. And during his tenure, he was responsible for ushering in a new era of cinematic capture through the launch of Lytro Cinema as well delivering uh, technology and content for many of the highest grossing feature films, including Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, Michael Bay's Transformer 3, and Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. John Caravan has presented at a range of industry events and conferences about the evolution of light field technology and its impact on future display implementations, including at NAB and SIGGRAPH and the Visual Effects Society. Please welcome CEO and co-founder, John Carafin. John, welcome. Good to have you here. I'm just going to go ahead and just give you the floor and let you roll with that. Is that okay? Uh, absolutely uh perfect. <laughs> well, then there it is. Thank you for the very kind intro and thank you everybody you for coming. And uh, I know it's late evening for many or early morning or everybody's around the world. So really appreciate you taking the time to hear what we have to say about solid light technology and holograms. And I really look forward to the Q&A at the end. So we're going to try and keep this right on schedule. Uh, see if we can go through the presentation materials and save about 15 minutes for Q&A towards the end. And we'll go through and answer anything else that you'd like to know. So let's go ahead and just jump right on in. I'm going to do our screen share and just confirm that everything is working as it should. All right. Checking with my producer over here. Are we all thumbs up? All right. Outstanding. Um, couldn't be more excited to show you some of the latest and greatest of what we're doing here at Lightfield Lab. Um, I've done a number of presentations, as was mentioned previously, with Seagraph, and it's such a wide gamut of an audience. So I'm going to do my best to try and cover a bit of the technology, a bit of how to think about the creative aspects of what holograms can offer and the types of 
the types of content you could start thinking about creating and then go through a lot of the applications that you'll start to see in the not too distant future. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I, I really do like to start here and speak to why why we are passionate about holograms. Why, why are holograms important? Why does this matter? And one of the things that's really interesting, and particularly as you see the impact of COVID and coming out of that, is that we're now looking at 2D displays more than we do anything else in our entire lifetime. And it is just shocking how many hours we spend staring at these things. And all of you are looking at your screens right now, and you probably have multiple screens open, as a matter of fact. But you, you're looking at these displays more than you eat, more than you sleep, more than you are talking to people. And that's crazy when you think about it, that there's something like this. And I'm going to try and hide this little window here, which Zoom is not behaving. But OK, well, we're just going <laughs> to. It just moved. OK, we're going to deal with that. Uh, but when you think about these, these 2D displays being more impactful and more prevalent in your daily life than anything else that you have throughout all of history of mankind is crazy. But it's still now 2D, even though our brains have evolved to see and understand the world around us because of objects and not 2D planes. So when you think about what holograms offer, it is the natural way to see the true world it allows you to focus wherever you want and see and fully absorb the content that is around you to give you better memory, better cognition, better understanding of that world. So you actually have more neural pathways that are triggered when you compare looking at a physical object versus the 2D illustration or the 2D counterpart. And you see that in today's landscape when we, we look at what other display technologies are out there. And to be very clear, I'm, I'm showcasing this just to help get everyone on the same page for terminology. These are all by themselves great technologies for what they are, but we like to make sure that we level set and define what is a hologram and what is not. So starting off with Pepper's Ghost, or I like to just call it the Tupac thing. And these are technologies that have a history dating back well over, well over a century now. And it's actually where the term smoke and mirrors partially comes from. Uh, on the top left there, you're seeing a more uh, retail kiosk version. And on the bottom, you're seeing a, uh, a large format stage venue. And what it really is, is looking at a 2D display on the top there, you actually have a, a like a tablet or a, a monitor that's facing down, you have a beam splitter and you're looking at the reflection, a 2D reflection of that monitor. And on the bottom, you're seeing more of a transparent shim that you're projecting a 2D image onto. And when you rephotograph it with a 2D camera or a 2D video camera, you're seeing now something that looks great because the 2D looks great, but it's flat and two-dimensional. If you saw that in person, you would know immediately this is flat and there would not be a question of, is that a hologram? But 99% of all the things that are out there are actually, that are, are branded as holographic are actually in this camp of Pepper's Ghost techniques. Um, the other technique and technology we'd like to highlight, we, we bucketize into volumetric or what I like to call spinny things. You see in the top middle there, a spinning fan. And the way that these things work is through a fan blade, has a, a strip of LED diodes and through the persistence of vision, you're seeing now something that looks like it's floating, but it is 2D and it's only existing because of the temporal aspect of how these fans work. If you reach out to grab it, it really hurt your fingers. I don't recommend that. Uh, but when you see these things, and you'll see these at all the trade shows, and if anyone's going to CES, you'll see these all over the place. They're super cool. They're attention grabbing, but they are two dimensional. You then see on the bottom middle here, another form of volumetric display. And the, the definition I'm using here for volumetric is that you have a 2D pixel that is now placed in space. And in this case, you have multiple planes that are time sequentially being rear projected and you see a volume you always will, with these technologies, see both the foreground, the background at the same time. You can't really have occlusion or reflection or refraction, or any of the true physics of what a real object requires, but you do have a volume. Think of it kind of like a, like a point cloud. 
uh, or a multi-planar setup in a uh, 3D space. So very cool, very attention grabbing, but it is not actually giving you something that's holographic. Another technique that is very common is auto stereoscopic. So think of anything that is what they'll call glasses free TVs or glasses free displays. On the top, you're seeing a lenticular display moving a camera back and forth. So you actually see how the lenticular is taking images and spreading them out along a horizontal axis. You get some motion parallax because you can move and see the, the 1D images but you're not getting all of the things that would allow you to focus on a true optic. There's another example on the bottom right that you'll see as well. And you can kind of see there that you get more of a 2D view more so than a physical object. Uh, and that's just by the very nature of re-photographing it with a 2D camera. So just to restate that these are all great techniques, great technologies for what they are, but they're not forming an actual object. We'll talk about how those physics work, why that is different, and how to start thinking about the content creation for those techniques. But what I think is even more important is to show visualizations for how to compare these techniques and what visually does it mean for you, the content creators and the technologists that are here watching this presentation today. So we've we prepared this through a simulation engine. It's gonna show you the same exact piece of content inside of that, uh, the proverbial frame there. And we're gonna repeat the same thing with the true physics of what the actual technology can achieve. In this case, you're seeing a monoscopic display or a regular TV, and it's doing all the things that you would expect if you're moving this camera around or you, the person, are physically moving and trying to focus in space. Looks like a flat poster, if you will but we have a very strategically placed mirror that's sitting on that little table here. And you can see that you're getting the parallax of a 2D plane as you are moving around and you can see how that offset is actually occurring. But again, you're looking in the mirror at something that is flat and two-dimensional. You don't see any reflections or refractions in the, the shiny objects that are in this environment. You're not seeing anything that is physically moving in space as you would expect for something two dimension. Let's now compare that to a stereoscopic display. And this is now showing you something that is happening in the brain. So you have to kind of connect this together, given the fact that as you move left and right or around the space for something where you would traditionally have uh, stereoscopic eyewear on, you're getting the warpage that occurs from different keystones, because it is an illusion that your left eye, right eye have to put together in the brain with stereopsis, and you actually do get these skews that are occurring. If you close one eye, you would of course see just the monoscopic version that we showed a moment ago. But when you put both eyes together, you're having to work really hard in order to, to form that stereoscopic image pair. You'll see much of the same cues as you got from the monoscopic, where you're not seeing reflection or refraction. You do get a little bit of the perception of warpage, which gives you a little bit of the sense of uh, some somewhat of that motion parallax, but you're in fact getting two images and you're not getting an actual volume of any sort. So let's now jump to comparing that to a multiplanar volumetric display, similar to the one that we showed on the first slide. And as you move to the left and to the right and in and out, you're getting both the foregrounds, the backgrounds, and you won't actually see something occlude something else in these types of displays because they are temporal in nature. You'll also see things that kind of get uh, somewhat blown out or you'll see the, the black halos around objects as you're moving around because you can't actually fill in some of that information. There are a lot of other techniques that are out there that do different things, but we like to really just show based upon the, the ones that have actually already come out to market. So this is giving you a little bit of an idea from the creative and from the technical standpoint, what a volumetric display can provide so long as you have a range of volume and a range of depth. So again, think of it a bit more like a point cloud uh, than you would think about it in terms of producing an actual object. Let's jump now to auto stereoscopic displays. And this is showing now the exact physics of the types of resolutions and the trade-offs that you would make 
for something that is lenticular in nature, meaning you've got a cylindrical optical element on the display and you're taking those 1D horizontal views and you're spreading them out. And if you go too far to the left or to the right in this type of an implementation, you're gonna see something go pseudoscopic. It flips because you're going outside of that, uh, that view box. So you do get the motion parallax because you do have horizontal image separation. And you do see some of that also in the, the, the reflection in that mirror, you're seeing a little bit of the, the movement within the reflections and the refractions. So it's, it's a very cool uh, effect and it gives you more depth when you're only presenting it as we are here in a 2D camera view, you're seeing the 2D views that are then effectively interpolating, but you're not getting reflection, refraction, focus, all the elements that make it actually look real this is something that'll give you stereoscopic or stereopsis that your brain is putting together. Now we're gonna compare this to a perfect wavefront display. And the definition here of a wavefront display is that you are actually creating the exact object with the reflections, the refractions, with everything that is native to forming the exact thing had it actually existed in space itself. And we'll show you some of the physics of excuse me, of how this can actually be achieved. Also take note of how you can see in the reflection of that mirror, the fact that you do in fact have all of the objects moving accurately, focusing accurately. The butterflies here you see going out of focus as the eye is moving in and out of focus, depending on where you, the viewer, would be selected. That is now indistinguishable from the real thing. And that is our our vision, that is everything that we are building technologies to support. This is a lot of physics that goes into doing just this. And we'll talk about how you can create content for these sorts of displays as well. So we keep talking about objects versus images. And why is it that we see a 2D plane differently than we see the actual physical thing in the real world. And it really comes down to light. Everything that we understand about this world is because these photons are literally flowing in all directions. And you don't see that bird's wing because it's made of feathers. You actually see it because those photons strike the surface, they reflect, reflect, refract, and ultimately a wavefront is presented to the eye. And your eye is literally scanning all around you're not forming an image per se, you're actually creating a chemical impulse you see with your brain, you don't see with your eyes. And that's why objects are vastly different than a 2D counterpart. So these flat displays, 2D displays, cannot recreate that same experience. It is fundamentally impossible. And what we are doing here at Lightfield Lab is untethering all of the headgear, getting rid of the other accessories, making something where you see a true wavefront of the actual object and changing the way that you would consume and visually communicate with media. The way we do that, and this is gonna be my, uh, my joke is this is the 101 level. We'll dive deeper and we'll see uh, how far we get, Jeff. Uh, we create the inverse and opposite reflection of the actual light that would have originated had the actual object existed right there in space. So you see for that flower, for the bird, for that bird's wing, you get the true wavefront that allows your eye to verge and accommodate and fulfill all of the things that are required for your retina, for your pupil to actually see and have true retinal blur. That gives you now something that is in fact as real as the real object. Now there's a lot of product oriented requirements that go into for what depth, for what range, and I'm sure we'll get a couple of those questions as well. We'll see how many of those we can answer with the time we have. But with that technique and technology, the way that we are building this display is very much akin to, if you're familiar with video walls, so the big large format walls that you'll see, they are built on PCBs and they are made into large panels and panels into full walls. We do very much the same, but we modulate at a density that is required to create the interfering spot of light in mid air. Now, each one of these little panels being about six by four inches, there's about, is already 160 million pixels that we can modulate. So that's 16K and I can actually show because I think it's a, it's a lot of fun to be able to show something that you probably haven't been able to see in any other 
medium, but this is one of these submodules that you would have seen a couple of years ago by itself. Um, going into this is a very high density of bandwidth. We'll talk about all the components and pieces that go into this, this technology. But this is a submodule. That's what we, we term these, just like you would have a, uh, a tile that goes into a traditional 2D video wall. Uh, but that's not the display. This is a modular, seamless surface. And what you actually can see today is the, the formation of the entire panel being very much like a cabinet in a 2D video wall. But with the, the smaller submodule, you get objects that are called little seahorse size, just for a nice visual comparison. When you get to now the 28 inch diagonal, you're getting two and a half billion pixels that are modulating in full real time and the scenes get much wider. So just like anything else holographic with larger surface area, you can then modulate and form a larger volume. So kind of sounds obvious when I say it out loud. So bigger things mean you can project bigger things. What we're doing right now as we speak is building out the pilot line to get us into large wall scale holographic projection. So going from this fish scene now to large environments, things where you can project holographic dolphins, for example. Haven't met someone who doesn't like dolphins, so we like dolphins. But it gives you a sense here for the types of sizes and scales that we are ultimately building towards. And I like to pause here on this three quarter perspective to show some of the rules of physics. So for this viewer that you see um, that is looking at the dolphins, she would see the entire scene perfectly as if it was right there in front of her. For us now at this three quarter perspective, you see these dolphins are outlined, which is a rule of, well, all light. You have to be able to see the illumination to see the object. And again, that sounds kind of obvious when I say it out loud, but it's outlined because you're now outside of the holographic surface. If you extend that surface out, make a larger wall, or you put another wall at a 90 degree angle, you could create exactly this at any of those angles. So it's one of the, the, the rules of anything holographic is you need to be able to see the light and have direct line of sight to the object. Uh, you can't freeze photons in midair. That's visual fix. Spoiler alert that uh, lightsabers are just visual effects. Uh, sorry if you aren't aware of that, uh, but you can't actually do that. You have to project either onto a medium or you have to be able to focus the wavefront and focus the light. So it gives you a little sense for how the product scales and how to think about how the technology is forming the light itself. Now, as we are launching the technologies, it's not just the display. There's a lot of tech that goes into enabling the formation of these wavefronts, but it's also providing the hardware, the software, and all of the compute that goes into this. We're talking about things that are producing 10 billion pixels per square meter. That is what we are able to achieve to fully fulfill the product requirements for anything of this size. You could do things that are higher density or lower density, depending on what market segments we'd be, we'd be speaking about. But to do that, and as you scale into full walls, you are then talking about hundreds of billions of pixels modulating in real time. And that is why we provide the entire computational back end to let you render in full real time. And that's with our wave tracing plugin suite. So things that are like your Unities, your Unreals, your Mayas, you can actually use your existing content so long as you have objects in a 3D environment, 3D scene, and you can place that onto the display. And the whole goal here is not to change your workflow, not to change the way that you would typically work, but rather give you the tools and the techniques and technologies that let you take that content and see it as a hologram today. So let me dive into the display. We're going to pull apart one of these panels and give you a, a bit deeper description of how this is possible. So starting from the back and going to the front, you're starting off with the proprietary FPGAs. These are the display controllers. They are acting to regulate the voltages and create the synchronization to form the pulses and form all of the, uh, the, the, the digital uh, amplitude that is going into and formed and fused into that second layer, which is our nanoparticle polymer fused energy relays. So think of this as now the bezel-less and seamless polymer that lets us take the light, form the light, and create the cones of amplitude 
that are acting as the digital modulation pattern for the complex phase gag. I'm going to go in just a moment a little deeper into the physics of what I mean about phase and amplitude and why this is all important and rather unprecedented. Uh, but it is giving us the ability to modulate and form an object in midair with all of the reflectance capabilities. Um, I like to show uh, the, the amount of IP that goes into this, um, not, not because of any other reason than it is not a derivative display. This is not something that is just putting A plus B together or putting a, a lens on top of a TV. This is a completely differentiated way of thinking about how you form light and how you are building a technology to support true holographic projection. And when you put all of these things together, you then have not just the one panel that you would see running right now, you see multiples of these panels, floors, walls, ceilings, anything that you can imagine to fulfill those requirements to form the object. One of our ultimate goals and dreams is to build the true holodeck. And this is a technology that can fully support all of those things outside of when people um, in some of the uh, science fiction movies and TV shows would walk off of the holodeck as a hologram. Of course, that's uh, that's good storytelling. All right. So now let's let's talk about those layers and how that ties to how to think of how does a hologram actually work? And this is one of those topics that we could do a full masterclass over months and months and months and months. And we're going to do this now in uh, five minutes. So let's give it a shot. All right. Now, everybody, I think, has used a magnifying glass before. And if you haven't, this is not going to go well for you. Uh, but for everyone who has, you know intuitively that you can make something look larger, right? See, my eye probably looks really weird. I can't see what it looks like, but hopefully you can see things getting larger. Now, if I if I ask any of you to define how and why an object looks bigger when you use a magnifying glass, it's harder to say, it's harder to articulate because you just intuitively know that things are being magnified, right? Hence the term. So let's dive into why this is. And many of you are very familiar with geometric optical terms. And what you see here are rays and optics and objects. Let's now convert that thinking into wavelengths and wavefronts. So you have now amplitude that would come off of that butterfly, for example. So you'd have all the light and the photons, all the things we show with the, uh, the hummingbirds and everything else in the prior slides. And then you have that wavefront that is then being scattered or reflected or refracted, uh, what have you, through that optical element. Now, that wavefront has a phase, and things that are in phase would be then self-consistent with that spot on that butterfly. And there's obviously not just one wavefront. There are many, many, many of these that are making up your ability to see that butterfly. Now, we still haven't answered the question because that question of how does a magnifying glass work requires you to be now viewing it on the other side. So what is actually happening with this magnifying glass is it is acting to change the phase of the object on the other side as viewed by this viewer. So you went from, let's see if you can actually see my little mouse here, this spot where the butterfly originally started and that had its own wavefront, you're inside of a focal length of that optical system, that phase is now being changed such that you have a magnified virtual image of that spot that you started with. So it is now giving you a diverging wavefront from the original wavefront itself. That diverging wavefront is where it will now be viewed further away from you and now larger. So that's the complex wavefront that you are then able to see because you have both the phase and the amplitude. And that is giving you the ability to now have that viewer focus on that object larger and further away. So uh, if anybody ever asks you in the future, how does a magnifying glass work? Well, now hopefully you have a better idea. Let's tie this now to why this is important when we talk about things that are holographic. If you separate now that wavefront into those core components of the amplitude separating from the phase. What we do with solid light is now not just one function, but now two functions. So you can think of it like now two magnifying glasses, because two is better than one, right? Okay. From here, if you were to think about this 
optical setup in a, the most simplistic way to describe how this hologram works, there is the amplitude component, which is the first illumination, the first wavefront that you see going from left to right. There is a transform that occurs, and then you can reform and the phase component that will actually focus the object in midair. Now, optically, this is called a real image. A real image is actually exhibiting in white light all of the things that a hologram requires. Here you also see inverse and opposite reflection, which if it was digital, you can then do all of those corrections uh, without it being inverted. So why is this a good analogy for how the tech works? If I overlay that with that blow up that we showed in a, a moment ago from the panel, you're actually seeing starting from left to right, the, the overlay of how we're forming the digital amplitude plane. We have our phase control plane that is then reforming the solid light object. So this is a very simplistic overview, but if you think now in terms of objects and wavefronts, and you, you actually can deconstruct anything that exists in the real world that you can see with your eyes, you can now form that computationally in free space as an actual object. That is the core of how solid light works. When you do all of those things and you form that object, just to really, really hit the point as clearly as we can, it is supporting everything that's required for true retinal blur. And what you're seeing here is if we were projecting this spaceship, for example, when you focus on that, you have the ability to focus on the, the front of it, the back of it, on anything. In the, in the real world, nothing is ever out of focus. That is a construct of where you have your gaze, where you are verging, where you're accommodating. And retinal blur is critical for you to understand how to focus on the object. It's actually a requirement. You don't get those requirements from things that are head mounted, from uh, things that are auto stereo. You're actually only getting a 2D plane that you are then using stereopsis or another technique in order to have the actual object form. In which case, it's not an object. You're just looking at images. For a true object, you would be having it where the blur is where your eye can actually focus uh, amazingly fast, actually faster than any other technology that is known today for autofocusing in a camera. So that is what the technology is actually fulfilling and how it is actually creating it. And at this point in the presentation, uh, we typically start getting the question of, well, can we see it? And is it actually a real thing? It sounds like this is way beyond um, other, other techniques that have been ever implemented in the past. And prior to COVID, uh, I used to always get up on my soapbox and say, we'll never show a, a, a 2D video of a holographic display. And then COVID hit, we went, eh, crap. Okay, I guess we're showing 2D video. So here you are, you get the, uh, the benefit of being able to see some of the things that we produced uh, through the COVID days. One of those experiences, and we branded these as our Defy experience, because we like to think of everything that we're doing with holograms as truly defying what your expectations are of what is possible with a display technology. And it is showcasing the real-time wave tracing engine. And that's a really important thing that I like to highlight here because what we're actually doing is giving you the ability to take all of the real-time engine, all the other things that you would typically do in 2D, but now you can do that with an object and manipulate that object in real time in midair. We're also showcasing in this case, real time facial and motion capture. So it gives you the ability to not only see and interact with the object, but talk to a hologram and have it respond to you. And I'll show you uh, after this demo, a bit of a behind the scenes so you can see a bit more detail on how the software and the content creation is working. Uh, this is the 28 inch panel that you'll see and where there's a number of different product trades that we do um, and our customers can do in the field, meaning you can trade off the fields of view or the object size or the object volume. In this case, we're showcasing about an eight inch holographic sphere from the 28 inch surface. And it is giving you the equivalent of 40 billion pixels per square meter. And that's effective because it is giving you that object in a tighter field, tighter density with well over a hundred degree full field, meaning that's your field of view that you can actually walk around the entire room. You could go wider, you could go more narrow. It really depends on what the application and what the requirements are. So with 
With that said, I'm going to show you uh, the teaser video, and I'm going to narrate on top. Is I think the narration is even uh, more interesting for all of you. And this is taking a 2D video camera, of course, and photographing the hologram. This is our Aztec, what we call the, the creator of light. His name is Aether, and he is fully interactive in real time. You can see that. Uh, blinking here, and he's going to talk. I away. am the creator of light. Now, he does a lot more than just that. That was a teaser because, again, we want to have um, uh, this was uh, for the for the media and they came here and you can even see uh, CNET was here and interviewed the hologram, which is pretty cool. Now, for the behind the scenes for how to think about how this was Welcome created, to light this field is uh, Jeff Barnes, who's actually sitting right over here. Uh, and he, in this experience. case, is being real time motion captured and the hologram is being projected all two and a half billion pixels in full engine. real time. That's being an unreal backbone. You could use any of those engines with the wave tracing systems and be able to interact with the hologram today. So that gives you a bit of an idea of how that demonstration is being put together. You could, of course, do things that are leveraging any other form of content creation. You can then start to think of as we roll these out, you're going to start to see larger types of venues. Those are the, the earlier of the applications is in entertainment. One of the largest segments that we have uh, uh, for the video wall market is actually known as the corporate spaces market. So corporate lobbies, anything that's in that kind of an enterprise space is actually the largest segment for 2D video walls. Uh, we like to showcase this as our tabletop designs a bit more longer term, but giving you the ability to literally sculpt and interact with light. Even further down the line, looking at being able to bring those objects into your everyday life. And then ultimately, I'd like to, I'd like to stop on this piece here because our ultimate vision is to bring one of these holographic displays into every device because it does give you the natural way to see and interact with the world around you. And I personally want to recall my memories like this and not as a flat 2D illustration. So that gives you a bit more insight into the true physics of what is possible. Each of those simulations are actually leveraging, just like in the, the, the first visual examples that we showcased, the exact things that are possible with a true wavefront display. And that is what we are doing, and that is what we're bringing to market trying to transform the way that we visually communicate. And I, I couldn't be more excited to work with each and every one of you to make this a possibility. So with that said, I think I've timed this right on uh, schedule, which is a world's first for me. Uh, but I'm excited to hear what questions and really start a dialogue here. Uh, would love to dive right into some Q and A. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm I'm here for you, John. I think that was a brilliant presentation. Uh, we do have several questions here. I hope you're ready for this. Uh, Jeff Kleiser asks, how does a wavefront image differ from a photographic hologram whose resolution is over 3K lines per millimeter? Fantastic question. Uh, we've got some... Uh... It's good to, good, to, good to see you, Jeff. Uh, it's got some experts here. So the resolution, it's actually a great question, and I'm going to plug our hollow wire uh, because we're actually talking about the resolution requirements for things that are holographic, which actually are really just fundamental requirements for visual acuity. So the thing that you're referring to, Jeff, is talking about things that are, think about nanoscale, because you're talking about the encoding of the film grain with monochromatic coherent light. And I'm trying to use my words carefully to make sure I uh, uh, answer your exact question here. So when you're talking about that and you're talking about coherent interference, you're actually only talking about a subset of what's required to do things that are in the, uh, the white light holographic interference, more of what we're doing. But when you talk about that kind of requirement, the things that are in that more traditional laser interference wavefront or encoding of the uh, the interference patterns, you actually are limited by the the particle size is what ends up determining your fields mm. is of the diffraction requirements. So, 
the question of can your eye actually see it, the answer is it depends on where you are in reference to that hologram. Those are actually such high resolution that under a microscope, it'll still hold up. We as a product company are designing it such that it holds up to the visual acuity and not waste the resolution on things that are invisible to the eye. So you can kind of equate that to 2K versus 4K versus 8K and at what distance can the eye perceive the differences we do the same thing for the hologram. So, well, um, Nicole asks a question: um, How can the display project for more than one person at a time? Uh, it's a great question. It's actually because it is a full wavefront; it is not an image. When you talk about things that are being projected or steered, and there's a number of auto stereoscopic displays that are doing head tracking. There is no concept of head tracking for anything that we're doing because you have the actual object resolving. If you think about that, uh, the butterfly example, where we're forming that with that, the hold up my little magnifying glass here. That object is actually being focused for a field. So long as you are within the field in which was a hundred, over a hundred degrees in that, uh, the Aztec example that we showed, you can walk all around. You're able to focus, walk back. You can walk, back to infinity, you can walk right up to the display. That object will always be there. It's just a question of, does it hold up to the acuity of the eye? And that's what we designed the product for. So I'm, I'm hoping yeah. that helped answer that question. Well, we'll just push back around if that didn't do it. Uh, right. I think it did, I think it did. Um, we'll jump around a little bit here. Um, here's one about you know, what are the applications being explored initially? Another great question. Some of the visuals that we showed towards the end of the presentation are the earliest of the application. So entertainment, corporate venues, anything where it's not about uh, a direct ROI per se, it's something where you are looking for differentiation, brand recognition, things that you want to bring people off of their phones and be able to look at some other thing. That is where you see the premium segment of the video wall market, which is where we're launching we are very much aligned in the same way. And I do see, I, I've got the Q&A up here. I see Nicole's asking, how is it different than lenticular as a follow-up to the prior question? And I'm, I'm glad, Nicole, I'm glad you're asking. Uh, couldn't be more different than lenticular because a lenticular is doing a 1D horizontal slice of images that is literally taking one-dimensional images, mm -hmm. interweaving those together and forming images to give you a left and a right eye. Focusing an actual wavefront, creating the interference such that it will come into focus. If I take a camera and I rack focus, it will go through the true depth of field. It lines up perfectly with the real object. If you take a uh, piece of ground glass, for example, we've done this um, for those that have been here in person. If you sweep yeah. through, you'll actually see the resolving cross section of the true object. So it is optically identical to the real thing given a certain photon density that you would want for an application. Um, lenticular is just left and right eyes. Interesting. Um, a simple question for you. These are all simple for you, John. Um, uh, that panel you held up, how heavy is that panel? Well, the, the real question here is, do you think I am um, uh, the, the Incredible Hulk? And it's really yes. heavy. And... <laughs> it was hard for you yeah. to lift. So yeah, we're calling yeah, so it, it an eight, 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 eight pounder. Uh, well, you can think of, so forget about the, the the panel. When you talk about the 28 inch panel, the thing that you saw the demonstration yeah, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. think of that in the 40 to 80 pounds, which is in line with other, uh, by area, it's about the same type of weight, about a one to two X in that range for 2D video walls, depending on the technology we're talking mm -hmm. about. So market appropriate. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose there's uh, more depth. Uh, with the scaffolding and everything else going on with that. Who knows? We'll have to all see it in person someday here soon. Um, Steve Wright asks, what is the holography in your tech? How's it going, Steve? <laughs> Steve and I go way back. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> uh, so that's a, a interesting question. When you say, where is the holography? That is the whole discussion about being able to create the digital amplitude patterns in real time alongside with the phase control with the phase guide. The two of those functions together is actually what forms focus. Focus is a hologram. 
And that's what either would be in monochromatic space or coherent space. That's where you can observe the interference pattern in white light, because don't forget everything around you fulfills the requirements to be an object. Recreating that with white light means you're dealing with incoherent spots of interference rather than coherent. It is a much more uh, challenging solution space, but it gives you the accurate color rendition and color representation. And it allows you to do things that are not using lasers specifically. Interesting. Oh. Mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared for getting off onto a laser discussion, but I won't. Um, but Timothy uh, Hutchinson is asking, it seems there could be medical applications such as folding proteins and surgical practice, et cetera. Yeah, I uh, would love to talk further about that if anybody... Um is interested in those types of applications offline. Uh, medical is a market segment for us that is in a next wave and a next generation of the displays only because of some of the regulatory things that happen for medical and the size and the different performance metrics that are a bit different than we're looking at for our first launch. But we do get a lot of interest in being able to show uh, those objects, show the simulations, CAT scans, other, other MRIs, and be able to visualize data in a very different way and also not have to put anything on your physical face um, for multiple people, right? And oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, but that is an area that we are very excited by. That's cool. That's cool. Um, Philip is asking, what kind of um, computing power is driving the display? Can it be run off of a laptop? <laughs> uh, one day, one day off of a laptop. Uh, it is a serious amount of compute, a serious amount of horsepower. Uh, you're looking at a computational server that is backing it. So you can run a master uh, application off of a laptop, but then you have the big computational stack. So you can think in the range for each of our panels between two and 20 GPUs that are driving it, depending on the real-time performance requirements. That's uh, customer driven, but you're, you're dealing with a, a very large amount of compute when you're talking about billions of pixels versus things that are in the millions of pixels for traditional 2D displays. Billions, two and a half billion, billion pixels. Hey, Greg Downing is asking, if your display wraps around you, well, we're not really saying wraps around you, but uh, Could let's, go take, around. let's take it, let's take it. Is your um, potential depth limited only to the distance between your eyes? No, 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 no. There's no uh, relationship between your um, uh, the interaxial or interocular as it uh, would be. That is a stereoscopic concept. When we're talking about the actual true wavefront projection, that depth is actually formed by, just like with the magnifying glass, the actual spot of light and the amount of phase resolution that you're able to control to generate the density of those formed spots. So there's a lot of physics that I'm uh, needing to unpack there. Uh, but think of it as you're focusing light. You're not trying to hit a left eye and a right eye. You could have one eye and still be able to focus on that object. You could have your eye, your, your interocular be really wide or really narrow, but it will look exactly like it should because it is a true wavefront. It is not stereoscopic. I get it. I get it. He has a follow on to that, which is, and how close can the image be to you or to your eyes? That is a total product of what are the product requirements we're trying to achieve. So uh, when we're showcasing that demonstration, we showed the video of you're typically one to two meters away because that is designed to be a larger scale uh, installation. So typically think of if you're looking at a television screen, there is a natural angle of view and a natural distance. That would be the comfort zone. There's a lot of standards out there that that um, that already cover that. I won't go into too much detail here. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same thing uh, for the hologram. The way we design it is to make sure that the distance for our customers for the target viewing is what we've optimized for. If you go miles away, it still holds up perfectly. If you go right up close to it, it isn't that it goes away. It's that you get lower contrast just because you don't have enough of those samples to cover. Oh, right, 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 right. That makes sense. Ah, uh, Gregory Panos. Oops. Gregory Panos uh, is bouncing around. Uh, are um, 
Our custom ASICs being, no, that too, being utilized to optimize computational efficiency and what hardware optimizations would be useful if processing architecture were to be built from scratch from tasks required? That is a much longer answer to fully address your question, Greg. Uh, so the, the, the long and the short of it is custom ASICs are part of a next generation roadmap. Uh, there are many custom processing things that are happening, uh, but we also are making sure that we're filling the requirements for customer programs. They're telling us the types of software that they need to run on it based upon their actual application. So we need to have both the legacy support as well as fully integrated support, which is mm. where you take something right now, you see here, you get a huge amount of um, integrated compute for the display drivers for all of the processors that go into FPGAs. And from there, in combination with GPUs and a lot of other processing that goes into this, uh, that will go into something that is fully embedded in future generations that's the natural progression for display technologies. You start with uh, FPGA, then you go into things that are um, ultimately ASIC and SOC afterwards. But that is once you go into higher volume production. But you're obviously very well aware of what that looks like. Mm. Uh, uh, Jeff Kleiser, one more time, asks, how long until you can feel the weight? Uh, into, uh, these things jump around on me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Until I don't know what happened to it. Oh, I I, I can see it. Uh, it's field a wavefront display at the same scale as yeah. Las, Las Vegas Sphere. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, the yeah. app. Well, it could happen. <laughs> so there's a much longer answer for that one, but the, that gets into even a more complex question of curving three dimensionally those surfaces which we actually can do with the nanoparticle polymers that we build. That is just not right. our first launch is I'm gonna want um, that same radius to be a product line. And uh, I'm not sure how many spheres that we can count on, right. uh, um, but that I is- I mean, there was that one question where if the image was to wrap around you, this is almost similar only on a larger scale. Uh, well, in the Las Vegas sphere case, you both have the inside and the outside, two different- uh, throw, throw the outside away. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I won't tell them. Uh, so that's where you can do spherical. That's kind of more the X-Men hologram style, uh, not to show my, my uh, nerding out here, uh, or holodeck where you have the perpendicular walls. Right. Right. So either one of them can work. You can fully control them in any plane, um, and that's all in the computation that you are forming the wavefront in software, that's part of the lookup tables. So uh, your direct answer of how long, uh, I don't wanna speak for the uh, for the sphere itself. You're, you're, you're talking about a good amount of time before you have that kind of capacity to yeah. build something of that size, but it's much more rapid than you might imagine. Interesting only a couple billion dollars and boom. Um, so... Well, if you, you happen to have a couple billion laying around. <laughs> hey, well. Uh, hey. Mom always told me uh, never turn money down. And no, never say no. Never always say, say how much. Um, <laughs> uh, Steve, right, one more time. If you sensed the viewer's hands in a three space, could they interact with the projected images? That is exactly right. Yes, you can interact with them. You can poke them, you can move them around. Uh, you can interact with any of the traditional sensors. You can have anything else as long as there is a Z awareness, meaning Z space awareness to use some of the three space language here. Um, you can have the objects move exactly in coordination with, if I point at the actual thing, my finger point is exactly in true X, Y, Z three space. Right, right. That object and you can poke it and you pop it and do whatever you would like. Okay, well, I, I, I find that very interesting also. Um, Urza Fine says, uh, very exciting, curious what infrastructure requirements a new venue would need to plan for, power, networking, what is the back end uh, tech stack comprised of? Is there support for an ST2110 IP based video feeds? Thank you. That's a lot of questions unpacked there. Uh, 
So short answer is uh, you tell us what you need. I'm sure we can make it work. Uh, longer answer is we try to target within uh, uh, a small multiple above what you would expect for a traditional premium 2D video wall. And then when you talk about the computational side, just like other things that are in that large venue uh, architecture, you have your media servers, they'll go in a different space, and then you can run that over fiber all very much the same way. In terms of the video feed, yes, you can actually support that if real time and interactive is not desired. That kind of an IP feed is possible. It's a really a question of, is that the is that the use case you're looking for just to have something on a stream, mm -hmm. more of baked content versus things that are interactive? A lot of our first applications are things where um, our customers want to interact with the objects just because of it's cool to see a hologram and talk yeah. to them like we are showing. Uh, but yes, you could do all those things, the exact spec for those requirements that you would have, we would be happy to talk through those. Cool. Hey, um, where can we see a solid light display running in LA? Like, is it in somebody's uh, storefront window anywhere? Where can we see it? You would have to come here to our facility. Oh, we you're have... so cruel. You're cruel. Yes. yes. And I can't speak to in this public venue uh, customer plans and their timelines of and marketing things, of course. Uh, but you can start thinking of in the, call it by the, Towards the end of next year, you might start to hear and see of larger things. Um, but in the in the next number of years, you'll start to see them out there in the wild. That was vague enough for us. Um, it's both <laughs> vague and clear. <laughs> hey, Audrey Phillips, a renowned artist, asks, are you uh, interested in working with artists as beta testers or develop content for you? Uh, we love working with the best and the brightest, and we would love to find ways to work together. We have a lot of taps and a lot of requests for our resources. Uh, so we need to mm. make sure that our customers are the ones that are really driving the how the content is being created, if that makes any sense. And as after we get uh, a, a larger amount of these units that we can start to distribute in a more wide fashion, then that's where you're going to start to see a lot of those beta type programs uh, with artists opening up. I mean, I would not turn down Audrey Phillips. I never know. said uh, I would love to do that. Audrey, <laughs> it's Audrey, I'm telling you. Um, I, I think we can try to- jam We actually, yeah, we, uh, Jeff Barnes, uh, 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 who's here in the room with me, reach out to Jeff, please. If you have interest in any of these sorts of things and different types of uh, collaborations, there's a lot of work that we're doing. And so- Audrey, please do reach out and anyone else that's interested. Fantastic. Uh, Peter, I'm going to jam these through. Peter asks, what are the energy requirements for your proof of concept display? Uh, so I think we, we briefly touched on that yep. in one of the other yeah. questions. So think of it as about two, one to two times the requirement for a traditional premium video wall mm -hmm. uh, by area. So you're, you're definitely not in 120 uh, regular household power. You're, you're definitely right. for, uh, enterprise, uh, but nothing that's that vastly different than what you would expect for other professional video wall displays. It's just another toaster. The, this next question is uh, interesting. Uh, I'll take it a little step further um, from David McLean. How can content be produced for the solid light? Let's just say it's the end of next year, John. And, you know, bigger things are happening um you know there you know there there's ways to pr produce content for ai there's this then there's that um is there what are your thoughts on you know commercializing this whole thing for us you know people out here in the woods uh making images and content yep. and animations yep. and whole movies so anything that runs in a 3d environment so your mayas your unreals your unities that works right now right you can literally use the wave tracing plugins it's a bridge, pulls out everything that it needs, and you could see that running on the display. Uh, usually CG is more where we're seeing the first applications, just given some of the things that are happening with it. Uh, when you're talking about live action, you can do things like motion capture. You can do things that are light stages. You can do things that are volumetric capture rigs. Any of the techniques that are already, already being used in professional studios, so long as you can bring it into a 3D environment, it works on the display today. Uh, if you're doing things that are legacy or 2D only, 
you can go through conversion processes. You can use AI. You can do use different machine learning techniques. We've done quite a bit of that and shown some of that for different customer things. Uh, but you can think of as long as you can create some three-dimensional representation of what your content is and you're already in one of those packages, the wave tracing plugin suite will support your requirements. That is going to be so awesome. I can hardly wait. Um, John, can you stick around just for a couple more questions? Yeah, certainly. Okay. And everybody I'm else, glad, stop, stop asking questions. Oh, that's great. That's great. People were okay, listening. So Gregory Peter Panos asked one more question. Could the viewer tracking be used to concentrate rendering resources so as to reduce implementation requirements for less expensive configurations? That's, that's, a, that's a smart question. Um, the challenge is, and we, we get this question a lot from uh, more of the display manufacturer side, that when you're creating the true retinal blur, you find that the total efficiency that you gain by doing this is actually pretty minimal because as you're forming those true focal cones, you end up having something where the, the illumination that you need to create is actually across the entirety of the surface. So from a computational standpoint, whether it's one viewer or an entire room of viewers is kind of negligible. Uh, there are certain scenarios where there is more efficiency that can be gained kind of to your point, but it's much less than you may think because it does form the actual object and does resolve that spot. Uh, but it's a really good thought. Wow. Okay, listen, uh, just a couple more. Uh, Ian asks, assuming you didn't want any kind of interactivity other than just being able to see from multiple angles, is it possible to pre-render scenes for viewing? Absolutely. And yeah. you can make an even more efficient computational system, which is much more just for streaming than it is about real time. So the, the actual back end um, complexity gets much lower. You just need more data storage, depending on how much content you're streaming. So yes, baking content, totally possible. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, an apology. Sorry for the repeat. This may have originally gotten lost in the shuffle. How is the wavefront actually generated at the photonic level, i.e. what are the light generation elements? So we don't publicly disclose the exact mm. light generating element other than to say that we're conditioning the illumination to form the cone of white light that acts as the digital amplitude pattern. So if you were to look at that surface directly, the, the nanoparticle surface, it's a bunch of gobbledygook and noise. It's not a human readable thing. Um, so think of that as generating the illumination that is fulfilling that first requirement in that butterfly example, where it's it it removes the phase from the equation. And then with the complex phase guides, that is what forms the focal spot of the incoherent light. So it's a there's a much longer, and that's why I, I try to uh, give the explanation and apologize at the same time that it would be a four-week masterclass on how all the photonics are working. Um, but think of it as you're creating the digital amplitude with a white light pattern. And then from there, you're forming the actual object through the phase guides that resolve the, the, the actual focal spots of the volume. Yes. Copy. I'll, uh, the test. Totally the clear, right? <laughs> Got it. Okay, last yeah. question. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to all the questions, um, but we got to let this man go. He's been working hard. Uh, you didn't talk, Philip asks, you didn't talk about image capture. Are you able to capture live images or is everything CGI for now? Yeah. Uh, you, Apple and all the other manufacturers do us a big favor to see all the multi aperture. You can put that on the display right now. That turns into an aesthetic and a quality question. Um, anything that has the depth information, meaning you can form something in a 3D space that actually can be put on the display. So it's really a question of intent and quality and what you're looking okay. to achieve. Oh, oh, Gregory Pano says, and I think this question is for me, final question, how did you get so smart? 
Well, Gregory, well, you know. I, I learned it all from Joan. I learned everything that I know. Uh, everybody that is at Seagraph, I've learned from everybody. <laughs> uh, a lot of these other questions we're just not going to get to. I got to let this man go. I got to, no, I can't. I, so there's a lot of, we're sorry. Um, you can also uh, ask me and I can um, ask a couple. I can ask people. I have connections. We'll get to your questions so you can get them to me. John, it's been a pleasure. We've all really learned an awful lot from you. And for everybody else, thank you for joining us. We are Los Angeles ACM SIGGRAP along with Silicon Valley ACM SIGGRAP chapters. You should join us. Keep coming back. You'll learn. You'll learn a lot. Thank you and good night. <laughs> We'll